Please be seated. I'd like to begin today sharing some personal sad news for me. I usually don't go in this direction, but the thought just kept driving my sermon as I was trying to figure out what to say to you today. On Friday evening, I opened Facebook to see a message that a classmate from Virginia Seminary had passed away. He lived in my dormitory, and he was from Ghana, on the western coast of Africa. Although I did not know him that well, I had worked with him on a grant proposal to get funding for fresh water for his community back in Ghana, where he was already serving as a priest. And we made an instant connection because I had been to Ghana the year before. I had been there on a tour where I had visited the infamous Cape Coast Castle, which served as a dungeon and embarkment point for the slave trade of West Africa. Like others I met during my trip to Ghana, he was gentle and generous with a spiritual presence and firm sense of purpose. But he was no pushover. I brought something I got from him. I got this stole, which is made from kente cloth. The word kente means basket. And it's called that because of the woven pattern. Historically, this kente cloth was a sacred cloth only worn on important times or by the royalty of the uh, Aiken tribe there, the indigenous people of Ghana. Now it has become, this cloth has become a symbol of ethnic pride and at time a controversial symbol about who wears it, when they wear it, and why you wear it. When I heard that news on Facebook, I wasn't thinking about that controversy, nor was I thinking about any other controversy in the news today. I was thinking about my friend and what else I could have done to welcome and befriend him. A man who was a stranger in this country with his family and church far away. When I visited Ghana, we were invited into people's homes for dinner. We were treated like royalty at the church. Was there more for me to do? Did they ever get that clean water that he had been working for? Regrets. But then again, regrets at a time of loss are common, though not that useful unless we learn from them. Overall, I would say I have been a good friend and a good neighbor. But I did not give that Jesus welcome, that compassionate welcome that Matthew is talking about in the Gospel. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. That kind of radical hospitality is about seeing how when we welcome the stranger, we are welcoming none other than Christ himself. If I had thought about welcoming in that way, surely I would have taken that extra step. Surely I would have gone an extra mile to welcome him, even if it meant putting myself out of it, even if it meant taking me off my game, my set schedule, my cultural comfort. The phrase, going the extra mile, actually comes to us from Jesus. In the fifth chapter of Matthew's Gospel, Jesus teaches 
If anyone forces you to go one mile, go along for the second mile. In those days, the Roman soldiers under law could force a Jewish man to carry a pack for one mile, but only for one mile, and no more. In his teachings, Jesus is using this story of carrying the pack, this experience, to say, go for Go further than you think you can. Go just a little bit. Jesus isn't saying go into indefinite and involuntary servitude. He's just saying go an extra mile. I am guessing that Jesus sees the possibilities that await us in that extra mile. Jesus makes going an extra mile sound so easy. God knows it's not. In these times, that first smile, the expected, the average, what has been required, it's tough going. The weariness of the disease and injustice which is bursting around us wearies us. The fatigue forgetfulness of grief and loss linger as normal days continue to elude us. These days, a good day is a one-mile day. Getting the grass cut, the beds made, the meals cooked and not ordering carryout. That is a good one-mile day. So how can we even think about going the extra mile? Why do we even bother? We bother because the first mile is about our doing. And the second is about God's. It is in that extra mile when we find ourselves turning to God, turning to God to keep us going, turning to God to show us the way. Doctors, nurses, leaders, and everyday frontline workers have had to go that extra mile these days without much choice. And doing so, we can feel and hear, and I have prayed this, like the psalmist, how long, O oh Lord, how long shall I have perplexity in my mind and grief in my heart? Look upon me and answer me. O oh Lord, my God, give light to my eyes, lest I sleep in death. The extra mile is both a response to and a turning to towards God. In turning, we hear more clearly a God that calls us, a God that says, come to me. Come to me, all ye that travail and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. In turning, we, like Abraham, say, here I am. Here I am. In trust and faith, we come to that place that Abraham called, the Lord will provide. Jesus has gone the extra mile to the ultimate degree in that full expression of self-giving and self-emptying love that only Jesus can do. And we have been gifted because of Jesus' gift to us. Now we are free. We are free from the burdens of sin and all those things that Paul likes to talk about in his letter to the Romans. He warns us about all those things that enslave us and have dominion over us, but now we are free, unburdened, we are free to live and grow in God's grace. From this position of grace, how much easier is it to imagine going the extra mile? I wonder what does it look like and where is it leading us? 
going the extra mile is leading us to that compassionate welcome, that radical hospitality that is itself service to God. It is giving the cup of cool water, which I'm sure everyone would like right now, that cup of cool water to the little ones in the name of the disciple. It is welcoming the other, welcoming the stranger, the one who offends, who offends not only our homes and our churches, but also our hearts. Compassionate welcome is neither unilaterally tearing down or firmly building up. Going the extra mile is about letting go of fears, of habits, of distrust, of pride, of the array of passions that tend to control us. What will that extra mile look like for us? It will look different for each of us. We all are starting at a different place after that first mile. For some, the extra mile of compassionate welcome is wearing a mask and as a loving act. For others, it may be reaching out with a card, a basket of food. And for others, it may be literally welcoming in the stranger, the exile, the refugee into their home. And for others, it may be about considering joining an online discussion about race. And for others, may be just about putting the pack down, putting our burdens down, laying our burdens down, and resting in the grace that God has given us. If we accept this invitation to go the extra mile, how do we know God will provide? How do we know will God provide? There is only one answer to that question, and the answer is yes. If we resign ourselves and say no, then all we are left with is a kind of hopelessness. If we resign ourselves and say no, then the story ends with the death of Isaac, with father killing son and brother killing brother. If no is our answer, we are left with a human story of endless cycle of war, poverty, racism, abuse, and injustice. But that is not the end of our story. Isaac lives. Jesus lives. God has provided. God will provide. So as we begin again, let us go the extra mile. And we will find our way and comfort there.